Welcome to the Two Geeks in a Microphone podcast, your one-stop shop for television, movie, video games, comic books, book reviews, and more. Now, without further ado, here's Steven and Mike. Well, hey, everybody. Listen up. Here we go. <laughs> it's going to be that kind of a day today because we have a special episode. Welcome to the Two Geeks and a Microphone podcast. Uh, woo! I am your co-host, Mr. Stephen Boster, along with my co-host, Mr. Michael Shanks. Mike, say hey to everybody, my friend. Good morning to all you geeks out there in geekdom land. <laughs> well, we also have another special guest with us. Um, it is my stepson, Mr. Troy Cross. Troy, say hey to everybody. Hello. <laughs> well, so here's what happened. You know, we our topic for today is the movie, the new movie, the Denis Villeneuve uh, movie, <laughs> Dune. And uh, we got done watching it last night, and Troy said, I really want to be on the podcast. <laughs> I said, okay. All right, bud. And he's going to share his score and all that kind of stuff, and we're all going to have an interesting conversation today, aren't we, Mike? Oh, yeah. I think this is going to be interesting. <laughs> okay. So if you have not seen the movie... Here's what's going to happen. We are going to give our initial review with no spoilers, um, and uh, we'll do that. And then we'll go into – Mike, I, I loved how you said it last week on last week's episode. You said spoilerific section. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a new term we're going to keep using. All right. I like it. Spoilerific. <laughs> I really like that. So – all right, so here is the Scooby Doo. Boo. We are talking about Dune, um, and so as you know, everybody, we start off with our reviews, and we do something out of five somethings. Um, and so, Mike, what do you think we should do? What out of five? Uh, uh, Chris blades. We could do Chris blades. Those are those knives that they oh, had yeah. in there that, that seemed kind of cool. They looked pretty. What about neat. what about sandworms? Sandworms. Okay. All I right. like sandworms. So, all right. So out of five, um, how should we do this? Who wants to go first? Mike, you want to go first? <laughs> Troy, do you want to go first? Yeah, I do. All right, Troy. Troy, so tell us how many out of five sandworms, how many sandworms out of five do you give the movie? And just give your initial thoughts about the film, why you liked it or disliked or why you gave that score. I give it two out of five sandworms because you had to really understand the story to understand the movie. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that is a, that is a critique we'll get into. I uh, that was my fear about this film that if you weren't familiar with the story, how would it affect your your enjoyment of the film? Okay. All right. Any other any other fun uh, things you want to share with your, about your score? Oh, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Every second of the movie, they played music, and the music was so loud. I was going to fall asleep during the movie, but I couldn't, because every five seconds, they would be walking, and then you would just hear, Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe that was a good thing. <laughs> maybe. Uh, it didn't help me, I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Okay, we'll get to that in a second. Yeah, Hans Zimmer did the score, and I do have something to say about that later on too. So, yeah, uh, I I don't think I'm a big fan of Hans Zimmer actually. Well, well, I'll, I'll just say this: what I feel right now, uh, I love Hans Zimmer, but this was Hans Zimmer's worst score in my okay. opinion. Well, you know, um, he scored uh, some of the DC movies too. He did Wonder Woman. He's responsible for the theme behind Wonder Woman. I will give you, I love the theme um, of Wonder Woman. 
That that he is a did, fantastic theme. He did the movie Inception. He did Gladiator. I mean, he's done a lot of movies, and I was sorely disappointed in this film. But of, see, of my critique of him has been in the past that um, you know, especially superhero movies like Superman, Batman. Okay, Superman. Uh, the original soundtrack was done by William. Uh, um, <laughs> yeah. Um, was it Jerry Goldsmith? Not no, Jerry Goldsmith. no, no, no. Um, about the original Superman? Yeah, the original. The well, Christopher Reeve. Christopher Reeve. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Now, uh oh, we're are you talking about the Star Wars? Yes. Oh, my, sure. My brain's scrambled. I That's blame it on this movie too. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Okay. Anyway, okay. let's just get on with it. So, uh, I really wanted to like this movie. I right. wanted to like this movie a lot. I love sci-fi. I know this is a classic sci-fi story. In fact, it's it's held up as one of the greatest sci-fi stories of all time. Mm-hmm. And I sit here and I go, why? <laughs> why? I don't understand. Right. I I just right. don't get it. Uh, mm-hmm. So with that said, I have to give it one and a half sandworms. Ooh, I, yeah, one and a half sandworms, and that's one generous. Sandworms can cut in half to go fishing with. Oh, yeah. What happened to the other half? Yeah, right. <laughs> well, like Stephen said, somebody cut it cut it in half to go f- uh, fishing for a goober fish from Star Wars: Phantom Menace. Oh, 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 wow. which is a much superior movie. Sorry. Wow. Ow. Oh, <laughs> ow. Oh, oh. Okay. All right. All right. Now. Okay. So I give it. Um, I'm giving it three and a half sandworms out of five. Ooh. Uh, and here's why. Um, both of you, well, Troy, you're absolutely right on the aspect of story. Um, if you did not know the story, this was my concern when I watched it, I've watched it twice. I watched it at home and I went to the theater and, um, and I did the theater second. And one of my concerns was as I watched it, I was like, if you don't know the story, if you don't know the lore behind that, I, you will have a difficult time with this film. I agree with that. And, and, um, and, and so I'm like, that's why, I mean, story, you know, me and story, you've got to have story in a film. And, and I knew the story. So that helped me with this film. But I, I did wonder for those who did not know the story, how's it going to affect you? So had now, you read the books? No. Uh-uh. Okay. Then how no. did, how did you know the story? The 1984 film. Okay. Okay. The, oh the, yeah. The, the one I couldn't make it through. The one that you can't make it through. And that that had pacing issues too whatsoever. Now, that's what got me interested in it. And I love the concept behind the film and and what it was. And so I would read up on it, you know, Wikipedia or different people's reviews about the story. What's the larger story? I never did watch the sci-fi one. The sci-fi had one as well, the a TV series on Dune, and they actually went through the Dune books. Um, I don't know how many they went through, but I do know they get into what happens after the Dune 1984 film. And um, I could I could not make it through the opening credits. <laughs> um, I was like, oh, my gosh, this is going to be so hokey, you know, kind of a thing. But, I mean, it's a sci-fi TV series. So um, so I knew the story. So I was aware of the story, and, and I kind of knew, okay, there's a lot of intrigue and stuff like this. I have heard that it is difficult to put it into uh, – the book is hard to put into film because, like, um, it, from my understanding, what I've heard is, like, there's a lot of people who talk in their minds, you know, kind of a thing, and they're talking right. to themselves throughout the whole thing. and uh, Which they portrayed and, that. In the 1984 film, they really portrayed it. Oh, really? Okay. Oh, yeah. They did it a lot. And so it was really weird. It made it really odd. And even in this one, while they did it a little bit, um, it was still, even though I knew what was happening, it was hard to follow. Okay. So I got a question. Yeah. So there's several parts where they're doing, where they they have subtitles, which is probably another reason I don't like this film. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. Um, But I thought... 
I thought they were doing some sort of sign language or something. Is that one of those points where they're actually just speaking in their minds? No, when when she was doing, from my understanding, ever so briefly, and and maybe a listener can can correct us, but the sign language part is some kind of that's some kind of way they're able to communicate. Okay, without, so they were doing a sign language. Thing. They were doing a okay. sign language right. kind of a thing. All right. I don't but think then, it was. Go ahead. Go ahead, Troy. I don't, I don't think it was like American sign language or anything, but like no. some. <laughs> well, no. Some made up like. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you. I don't, I don't believe it was ALS or right. ASL, American yeah. Sign Language, ASL. Yeah. Um. So yeah. So now the reason, just to wrap up my part on the score, the reason I do it higher though, is I took away, I took away the you know the point and a half primarily for the story. Um, but the reason I gave it the rest of it is, it is one it is beautiful. It is a beautiful shot film. It is art. You're watch- you are watching art. You're not watching a movie. You're watching art, in my opinion. Um, now, am I saying, oh, it's so artistic. It should carry the movie. Uh-uh. Nope. Nope. Because <laughs> it's, I think it visually, it's great. You, you could put that on your wall as a digital screen and just have it playing and, and, and like, okay, that's beautiful art. But is it a movie? No. <laughs> it's not. Um, the acting was really good you had some really good high caliber actors who really did their part i just wish they had more lines to deliver to explain the story i agree there were some great actors in it i that i which is another reason i really really wanted to like this movie actually i didn't realize that um what's his face podameron was in it uh i can't think of podameron's real name uh he was (laughs) yeah Uh, Isaac, Isaac, yeah, last name Isaac, R- right? Yeah. Oh my gosh, we are so I can't. I'm afraid to touch anything yeah. else on my computer. Earlier, I couldn't think of John Williams' name, and now, now I, right. uh, John Williams is more important than he is. <laughs> John Williams. <laughs> yeah. Um, earlier, I was trying to think of who who uh, composed Superman is John Williams, and I don't know. I had a brain fart for some reason. But but Zimmer did do the new Superman, Man of Steel. Right. He did. He did. But see, I. I have an issue with his new superhero stuff. They they've kind of taken away all themes. There's no, you know, other than other than Wonder Woman. Oh yeah. So yeah. there was a certain theme for each character, right? In how like John Williams style, right? John Williams style was really good. Um, oh, John Williams is the master. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, I didn't think the music to this movie was bad. I, right. You know, it was. It was fine, um, but I didn't think it was anything spectacular either. It was not. I, I was very surprised. Um, I think, well, we'll get into, maybe we'll get to a little bit more music or something. But uh, by the way, that's Oscar Isaac. Oscar, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Finally. Gosh, so yeah, you, know. you had Oscar Isaac. Um, you you had uh, Aquaman. <laughs> mm-hmm. Jason Momoa. Jason Momoa. Which... Yeah, Troy, did you have something important you're gonna say? Um, yeah, I kind of felt like the entire story uh, revolved around uh, Paul's dreams, the main character, and it was kind of annoying when he finally met her, and then um, it it lasted for like 15 minutes, and then said, "Come for part two. Right? Okay. So, <laughs> oh yeah, I wanted to ask you about all, that. All the different dreams. And with all the different dreams and then seeming to lead up to meeting uh, uh, Zendaya's character, which was uh, Chani, Shawnee or Chani, um, and then finally meeting her and then all of a sudden the movie ended. Yeah, if, yeah. The mo- if they want to do that, then the first thing they should do is um, get rid of some of the dreams because that took up way too much of the movie. And I'll be honest, I I didn't even know who the heck she was. Neither did I. (laughs) Right. Right. But the movie does not do a good job with it. Well, here's the thing. Okay. There or I'm over the reviews or the our initial reviews. Are we are we ready to go into spoilerific territory? Anytime you are. All right. So okay, everybody, get ready because not only are we gonna talk spoilers, but I think Mike and uh 
and Troy are going to do the smackdown on me here. They're going to gang up on me for why this movie it was not as good as it should have been. And I do agree that it's not as good as it should have been. I'm uh, sorry. Did did you say something? I dozed off for a second there. Ah, nice. <laughs> nice. Which, by the way, I did all through this movie. <laughs> You snooze through all the whole, the movie. Oh my gosh! I, every every time I turned around, Brenda's tapping me, going, "Hey, you, you're doing a podcast on this tomorrow." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I would try to fall asleep during the movie too, but then you would hear the music because it was so loud in the movie theater; it would echo off the walls. Because I'm sure it wasn't that loud in the actual movie, but in the theater, it bounced off the walls and it hurt my ears really bad. Well, was, I wasn't was trying to fall asleep. I was just falling asleep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, here's okay. So here, let me talk story. I was going to talk story, and we'll have a discussion, and then we'll okay. go back into actors and music and that kind of thing. Because I think the biggest issue with this film is story. So I think you're right. The, here's the dealioso. Uh, the movie should not have been split up into two parts, um, first of all, because I don't think the second one's going to get made. Two parts. I heard it's three. I, I really hope <laughs> not. I really, really hope not. And as soon uh, as I heard it was three, I said, uh, I'm bringing that up on the podcast because Stephen was just saying on our Halloween kills, he doesn't like trilogies. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> well, uh, Apparently, from what I'm hearing, this is a trilogy. <laughs> I hope not. I really do. Troy? I felt like it was like, a, um, what was it called? Avengers Infinity War, where you have all this like three hour build up to uh, the guy with the stone in his head dying and then Thanos like snapping. And then you have to wait like two years for the next movie. Right. Which is, and that was four hours long. And that wasn't even that good. The only time I actually was really intrigued was when Spider-Man came back. Right. Right. Spider-Man was back. Yeah. So the it's the same concept as what you said, Troy. It's the thing of uh, I don't watch a movie to lead into another movie. And you're absolutely right. That's why I did not like the way they did this film. Um, it, gosh, I hope it's not a trilogy. Oh, my goodness. If that's the case. See, I thought it was just two parts. It was going to be a two-parter. And I didn't like that concept because it was like you have three acts in a story or in a film. Mm -hmm. You've got the first act. You have the second act. And then you have the third act. The first act, we got to see the first act. That was the whole thing of the fall of the House of Trades. That was the first act. Then the second act is the journey you know, kind of a thing to recover from, you know, the whole thing. Well, we only, we only got halfway through the second act. Right. And then the third act is where he comes back and, and is, and it's amazing. It's a great story at the end, by the way it builds, because here you have a character, Paul Atreides, who starts off as like this wimpy little kid, but by the end of the film, he is, he is, super powerful now and just incredibly powerful i have to say there was one line you know i i love looking for lines in movies that you know that it, that can be quoted you know so on and so forth and there was only one line in this whole film that i thought was memorable and that's okay. when when jason momoa looks at uh the the main character paul and he said oh are you gaining are, it looks like you're gaining a little muscle there. And he goes, Oh really? Am I? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Right. No. That's, that was thrown in there. Yeah. That was one of those. Weird and it was great. I fun, loved it. Fun I, you know, it was a fun moment and I'm like, that was it. <laughs> My favorite line, um, was where he was talking to his dad on the shores of wherever, where his family, you know, the whole family crypts were, it's, it looked like and stuff. And he said, um, well, you know, and he, Paul Tracy is telling him, I don't, you know, I don't want to know if I want this. And, you know, he says, uh, you know, he has the ring and says, I didn't want it either. And he goes through that and he's actually says another great line. He says, you know, l- you know, leadership, you know, great men are called to it, which I thought was, you know, or it was really interesting, but my favorite line was, but you'll still be all that I ever needed you to be. And that's my son. I was like, Oh, Aww. that's great. You know, kind of a thing. 
So, okay, I'll give you that. That was a good line, but I did. I honestly didn't remember it. <laughs> right. That's all right. Um, so uh, the the story wise, the biggest thing, and in, that's in, why we're in spoilerific territory, is because what happens to Paul in the rest of the journey is he meets up with the Fremen, learns more about the Fremen, which is really good. He becomes the process of him becoming one of them and becoming a fighter and becoming a man that the first one, he's just a boy who survives what happens. The middle, the second act is where he he becomes a man. But then the third part is where he becomes the hero, the messiah, the the quiz act, Hatterack, or I, I never can say it right or, you know, kind of a thing. The quiz What's act, up, Troy? Hatterack. Yeah. So. I mean, I didn't really like the whole concept of when when someone split up from the pack, they kind of just died. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's what I had to say. Well, <laughs> so, Mike, what, when Troy and I were talking about this, it, Troy, it, Troy brings up a really interesting point. He noticed in the film that anytime somebody went away from the crowd or away from the group or split off, uh-huh. they died. And oh, I thought they would, they would come like with a lot of self pity, and then they would be like, "I'm a hero," and then that one person like put the thumper in the ground, and she killed herself. She could have ran away, but okay, she didn't. you're hitting a lot, you're hitting a lot of stuff there, Troy. You got to help us out here. What? So okay, so when they went into that uh, shelter to hide from the sandstorm, and those pe- and the enemies came in. How okay. she um, split up, and she was the girl with the blue eyes. She split up from Paul and his mom. Uh-huh. Um, and then when she left, she got up. She saw a sandworm coming, and then she got killed. And then she right. put a thumper. She puts a what? thumper in the ground, and then she kills herself. No, she doesn't. Well, she she was mortally wounded. So she did put the thumper in the ground because she was calling the worm. Because when you saw her with those right. two like, like pickaxe things, she was getting ready to ride the worm, and I'm like, "That's gonna be awesome!" And then she, and then the assassins, the elite imperial soldiers, killed her. And so she was like, she knew she was dying, and she said, "I'm gonna take these guys with me." And that's why she beat the ground so that they, the worm would come and eat them. Yeah, might as well take somebody else out if you're you're gonna go anyway. So right, I mean, I get that concept that you yeah. know, there's nothing wrong well, with that. Yeah. Well, here's the thing, Troy. I thought about what you had said, and I thought, you know, that's interesting because when Duke Leo Atreides went off on his own to kind of see what the lights were and stuff, he went on on his own, and then all of a sudden he got shot in the back, you know, with a little thing, and, and you know, we find out who the traitor was and stuff. When Jason Momoa's character... Who I did, I did like him. Oh, uh, Duncan? Yeah. Duncan's character. Yeah. So there there's something about his character in the in the lore that is really unique. And I don't know it. Don't don't quote me on this, but I it's either he's cloned or he generates or he comes back again or oh, something. Oh, so we're gonna something. get him back even though he died. I, I I don't know for sure what the lore is. You don't see it in the they talk about it being in the books, not being in the films. Hmm. Okay, and so I don't, I don't know really what it is. I haven't read the book really to know. I don't know. I don't get it. Why do you uh, why do you sign somebody as big as Jason Momoa, and then you only have him in the first film? Right. Uh, to me, right. that makes no sense whatsoever. Because yeah. that I, loved- I guarantee you that guy sold tickets. Oh yeah, for sure. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. Yeah, and he was great. He did a great job. But and I thought that whole last scene again. He's by himself. And uh, Troy, I think you're right. You know, he gets killed kind of thing, but boy, did he go out fighting because those that's him. Duncan Idaho is like kind of like the elite soldier for house of trades, you know, that he teaches everybody. He's like the best of the best. And to see him go up against the Imperial best of the best soldiers and dude, did he handle himself well? And that that was one of the more exciting parts of the film actually is his, his fight. Yeah, I think I did enjoy that. Yeah, I, I would have to say there's probably less than a handful of exciting scenes in this film. <laughs> it's it's hard to um, get attached to a character when they die, 
if they're already in another film. Because the entire thing, once I saw Duncan, I was like, <laughs> Aquaman. <laughs> 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 right right it, it is so it, it was kind of hard for me to pity his death because he and it was kind of stupid how he went back out there i would not do that oh when he went back out there to fight <laughs> yeah yeah i thought that was interesting unless it was just to give them more time or something um i think it was just that's him just, he's protecting paul he is. I'm just surprised he didn't go with him to protect him, like shut the door, lock the door, bear, and then they start running. So he's always with them. But that's not the story. But, but see, that was discussed. That was discussed that he would go with him. And he said, no, you're not going with me. So mm-hmm. when the actual time came, he made sure Paul wasn't coming with him because I, I, I think Paul would have went with him had he not locked that door and yeah. and. I knew that he would have died. Right. Exactly. Good call. Good call. No, that's I good also, I also just didn't understand why instead of, I didn't understand the dust cloud scene, like where he flew the helicopter into the dust cloud, the dust storm. Right. Because couldn't he just go above it like that uh, the Freeman person said? Yeah, that's a good question. Okay. Uh, so one, he, he re- um, Troy referenced a video game called Just Cause. And so you can do all kinds of neat stuff in that. So that's where you're referencing. So, but uh, he should have been able to, I assume that he didn't fly up because they had fired those three shots at him. The, the three missiles were going after him. And so I figured they couldn't because, because they knew if they rose up, it was just those bullets were going to catch him. And the only way is to go ahead and go straight into the storm to try to try to fight them. It's a good point because they did, again, the story didn't give you, more explanation what why they were doing what they were doing you know thing and 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 i think that's the director denis villeneuve he his his style he did blade runner 2049 which again was visually incredible but story-wise did not flow yep Um, i agree the, the arrival was an interesting film slow burn until you get to the very end and it's revealed you know, the big twist on it. If you haven't seen it, it's actually, if you can hang in there, the twist makes you go back and think through the whole thing again. Um, um, it, it's an interesting thing about language and stuff. So anyway, but, and, and I, I worried about that for this film, but one, I knew it would be beautiful and it is, it is beautiful compared to what we got with, the way they did the shots and everything compared to 84, the 1984 version were incredible. Um, and I enjoyed that from an artistic point of view. I'm, I'm sure there's going to be pictures and posters and I'll probably do screensavers and all kinds of stuff with that stuff. Cause it was really, it was really good. I love the little helicopter, the, the dragonfly. Yes. Thing. Yeah. Loved it. I absolutely loved it. Um, and that's what I got showing on my screen behind me. Yeah, the the helicopters are pretty cool. I like those. That's one of the few things that I really enjoyed in this film. Yeah. Yeah, Yes. Speaking of the helicopters, another thing with the dust cloud, I don't understand how they didn't get, like, also, like, I don't understand how they didn't, like, at least break a bone when they hit the ground. Because he was, he was gliding, and then all, like, almost all of the wings fell off, and then he hit the ground. And they seem to be just fine. Like they just walked away, which I didn't. I just didn't really get. Right, and that's a good point. And, and again, sometimes in movies, it's not about realism, even though we want realism. Right. We don't want realism. So that's an interesting point. And uh, all I can say is, I said, well, he probably just maybe that's why he had it spinning and rolling, so that way it wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't be just a smush of a dragonfly bug against the sand <laughs> kind of a yeah thing. I, I another part that i really didn't get was he had all these i know i already said this he already he has all these visions of the people with blue eyes and like one of them was like in one of his visions he was like come with me boy i'll show you the the way of the desert right I'll isn't that the guy life. that Isn't that the guy that, like, wanted to kill him? I have not had a chance to double-check that, but yes, I do think that's who that was. So then if his, if his, um, 
It didn't Dreams. make sense. Troy, I agree with you. It did not make sense. You know, here he has this vision of this guy who says, hey, I'm going to show you the ways of the desert. And then that ends up being the guy who he has the, the last battle of this film movie with where he kills him. And I'm thinking, that's so weird, you know? Yeah, and, and then with Zendaya's actor, I kind of felt like... um. I, it was just kind of weird because Zendaya's actor was like almost exactly as she was in the um, dream that he had. But then that guy was totally different than what he had thought he was. Yeah, they don't do a good job of explaining the dreams, the visions. You know, once he had her asleep and all of a sudden he was having them during, you know, while he was awake and in those kinds of things. And they just they don't explain it well. And I think that's a good point. So um, that's it, it. It's not a clean film. It really isn't. No, it's not in the least. No. And, and, it, and it's it's hard story to begin with. Go oh ahead. Mike. Gosh. I'm sorry. And it's. I think the runtime on this is about two hours and 38 minutes. That is a long, long film, especially for being drug out and uh, just not much action. I mean, right. Oh, it I'm may sorry. Have been pretty. <laughs> Listen, it may have been pretty and it was right, but it just didn't move along. No. And, and here's the thing. The, the 1984 version was just over two hours. It was like two hours and 15 minutes. And I'm thinking, you know, for two hours, almost two hours and 45 minutes, you could have told the whole story and made it beautiful, told the story, and continued on. Right. I and I'm hearing now that it's three films. Oh, my God. And three films at two hours and 38 minutes? Mm, I mean, I don't, I, I don't know they're going to be all exactly the same length, but man, well, that, I, that was my issue with the Hobbit. The Hobbit is not a big book, but yet they made right. three movies out of it. Right. I'm like, seriously, they drug that one out. They drug it. They, out. they drug that one out where, you know, the, the Lord of the Rings, the, the fellowship of the ring was its own book. Two Towers right. was its own, its own book. book. And yes, they went three hours. But and Return they did of the King. The whole story. And Return of the King was really good. Right. Yeah, Troy. Okay. So I really feel like this movie, if it is a trilogy, all three parts are going to end up on Cinema Sins because it's, it's, <laughs> it's just so unrealistic. What is Cinema Sins? Sins. Cinema Sins is a YouTube channel. Well, it, it, it's a YouTube channel where they, they talk about everything that's wrong in a movie. And the guy is super sarcastic. It's really, they're really clever and really good. So he keeps a counter of all these sins. Oh. <laughs> and, and sometimes he'll be like, okay, this part was good. I'll take off three sins for that. And it's kind of a thing. So I might have to it, check this out. You will. Yeah, it's it's pretty good. So yeah, that's a good call. I, I um yeah. I again the issue is it's you it would it should have been one film. Um and it should have been explained a little bit better. Was it beautiful? Absolutely. The shots were great. The battle scenes, the battle scene of the ending first act, well, w would have been the ending first act, but that battle scene was epic. I mean, you scope on a large screen, what's much better on a small screen and seeing the scope of how big these ships were and how they were getting blown up and how they were just decimated. You know, House Atreides was just, you know, decimated because of all that what happened. And then the other part was um, the um, – oh, how shall I say? the I did appreciate the fact they did bring up some – it took some time how they did it, but to show the whole political issues that were going on, that the emperor, the grand emperor, uh, Shaddam IV or whatever, was jealous of House Atreides – growing but you don't you, you don't understand how he was growing in popularity or whatever didn't like it so he sent him to take over dune which house harkonnen had for 80 years and all and all of a sudden you're going to switch it off and and how are they letting it go without a fight well they didn't because they knew in the grand scheme of things they were going to attack them and take them out it was all a plan. So the emperor chose the side. Now, to his credit, Duke Leo knew that you don't pick this up in the film 
Um, but he knew that's what was happening. Okay. That's why in the film, when you see it, he's like, I thought when he said, I thought we would have more time that alludes to the fact that he did know what was happening and what was going on. Okay. Oh, this was a rough, rough. rough. <laughs> and you know what? Yeah. Go Pe- ahead. People always criticize the Phantom Menace. Okay. The, the the criticism I always hear from the Phantom Menace is it's too political. All I all all they talk all they do is talk about trade routes and and stuff like that. Okay, first of all, Phantom Menace has action within five minutes and thirty seconds of the film, and I know this because I started watching it this morning to make sure. Uh, you want to prove your point? Yes. <laughs> yes. So five minutes in the film, there's action. I, I couldn't even tell you where the action started in this film. I, I'm like, uh, yeah, this this could get exciting any time now. <laughs> I kept looking at there the was, clock going, how much more time do I have on this film? Yeah, there was no action opening sequence for a film. Right. And I get the fact they were trying to stay true to the, to the books. Um, but there is a difference between books and movies. Now – Books serve as incredible fodder to create film. Of course. But we mm. have become accustomed. We have scientifically been able to develop film stories based upon what connects with audiences. And so having that exciting opening sequence is really big. Now, authors today are taught to do that for new books that come out nowadays, right. and you see that. But back then, I mean, you got to realize this that book is, what, over 50 years old? Yeah, it came out like in 1965. <clears throat> is that when it was? Uh, if uh, Yeah, I watched a couple of YouTube videos this morning about Dune and some of the history Listen of Dune. Listen to you doing your research. Uh, I, awesome. Hey, look, look, I, I, wanted, I wanted to know a little bit of the history and, and be right. up on it and stuff. Um, I mean, I didn't like the film, but, I, you know, I understand it has a place in science, science fiction history. And I am mm-hmm. a science fiction nut. I love science fiction. Um, mm-hmm. But, man, I just, I could not get into this. And I, I really tried. I really did. Mm-hmm. It, but, oh, it was rough. <laughs> it, it, yeah. I mean, I knew the story. And I think because I knew the story, it did help me with this film. Um, and then I was able to enjoy the film from our artistic point of view, from a cinematic point of view. Gosh, look at the scope. Look sure. how big they, they've done this. I mean, at, remember at the very end where they where um, Paul and his mom cross the desert and then that sandworm is coming up behind them. Right. And then it stops. Now, you don't realize it then, but there is something to be said. The reason the worm didn't attack is – the, there is some kind of connection that Paul Atreides has. That's why he's so sensitive to the spice. And and there's something going on with him. And so that's why they well, you know, stopped. I, I heard that his mother is actually the daughter of the bad guy. Uh, I Of the bad guy? The Baron? Uh, see, I... Uh, Who's the bad guy? Who are you referring? You mean the Emperor? I... I don't, I don't think so. No, I think it's the I th- I think it's that guy that grew real big and I think. Oh, I don't know. I, I, I all don't I know, know is she is supposed to be the daughter of of whoever's in charge of the opposing family or Harsarkonan. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. I don't know. All I think I know, he go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead, Troy. Okay. I think he's talking about the guy that uh sat in the black goop. Yeah, that's who I thought, but you know, I, I I'm so, he, so confused at who's who in this film. <laughs> it, it, it is, it is a, it is a political intrigue book. Different houses, different warring houses, or whatever, and everybody's under the emperor. And not only is the emperor scheming, but his mom is a Bene Gesserit, which is kind of like a convent. You know, he introduces this whole religion. Right. And th- it doesn't explain it in the film, which is unfortunate. The they they have been at work through the centuries crossing bloodlines. And I would assume royal bloodlines, like you said, that may be the case. I don't know. Um, to create 
uh, an individual who they're trying to, who has this ultimate consciousness. And they kind of allude to that a little bit, the Kwisak cataract. And, and so with that, uh, the, the Messiah kind of a thing. Right. And so one of the things the book does, it kind of introduces some of the, uh, um, how shall I say the, the behind the scenes of them working as well. So they have, they have their own, uh, what's the word they have their own agenda. The Benny Jenner, Benny Jenner, Jenner, I can't even say it now, the Benny Jesuit. So, so not only is there political scheming, but there's religious scheming. And I think that's part of what they were, what they were, you know, kind of doing and what was going on with them. I don't so, know. I was so confused about the whole thing. Um, I, I understood they were warring over the spice um, and the spice is a, you know, huge commodity. Um, it's both a drug and a fuel. I, yep. You know, I did figure that all out, all out, but I, yeah, I'll get back to that. But yeah, I right. got confused at who was who and who was fighting who, and you know, yeah, you yeah, can say like whatever that. you want about Star Wars, but everything's clear cut in Star Wars, and I like it that way. Oh, and it's fun, <laughs> right? Now they've been quoted as saying they were trying to create Star Wars. The, the well, film for they're trying to do that for adults. Like they said, you know, well, but the, Wars, this, this was, this actually, the story actually came before Star Wars. It did. It did. Right. And, and it influenced George Lucas. George Lucas did pick out some stuff from this. Right. Um, um, but I think what Lucas got was pretty minimal. I mean, you got some very agreed. basic. Agreed. Uh, I'm not saying it's a big influence. Yeah. It wasn't, like you know, there are some people that try to say, oh, well, Dune completely influenced Star Wars. No, there no. were a few aspects that George picked, you know, but every, every, every writer does that, you know, they're influenced from the things that come from before them, you know, sure. There was a sand planet. Yes. We had a sand planet in star Wars. And then of course we've had more sand planets since then. Um, and we had, uh, I, I liked one YouTuber I watched this morning. Because uh -huh. he said uh, most people like to say that the Salic Pit was inspired by the worms. And he said, he said, actually, I think the crate dragons in Mandalorian were inspired more by the worms because of the way the crate tra dragons uh, traveled underneath the ground and such. And, and the sand people, the sand people tried to kill the crate dragons to get that pearl from them. <laughs> which is something that, you know, and these people of, of this planet were kind of doing the same thing. They were trying to kill the worms to get something out of the worms, too. No, um, the, in, in Dune? Uh -uh. Yeah. No. Well, no, that's what I heard in the books or something that that, that happens. Well, all right, this is our spoilerific thing. Sure. The So here's the deal. So the worms, the... What happens later on is this thing called the water of life, which, it, from my understanding, comes from the worms. And the spice also comes from the worms. Right. I also heard that, too. So that's in um, – they held the worms in great respect. See, that's sure. the thing. They just had to – they tried to learn to – how do we as people interact and live within our ecological system? Okay. And, and that's really kind of what was happening there. So – the the water of life is, is imagined like spice super concentrate, I guess, is how I equate it. I could be wrong. You know, someone may be real technical about that, but that's just how I equate it. And and so what ends up happening is she become the his mom becomes their reverend mother. Their reverend mother dies. And so she takes her place and but she has to drink the water of life. And and when she does, that that's kind of what they do when they become rather than just nuns to mothers you know I, I, this is a bad analogy you know from catholic church but when they graduate when they become mother superiors or whatever uh, gotcha. and so she drinks the water of life well it expands your consciousness it expands your spirit. you know there's all kinds of things that it does well the thing is is remember paul said she was pregnant so yeah she's pregnant and so the the fetus the baby in her ends up drinking the water of life too. So that that's another part of the story um, and what happens there. Then 
the end of the beginning of the third act is where Paul drinks the water of life as part of these continuous prophecies he keeps doing because Paul actually takes on the biggest worm that's at the biggest sandworm that's out there and rides it. That's like his initiation into not just manhood, but leadership. Right. So he becomes leader of the Fremen because of that. And so because then because he did that also is another prophecy. And then the next thing he had to drink the water of life. And that's when, when you see in the films or in the Navy form film, they called the sleeper has awakened and it was something his dad told me, but they didn't bring it up and uh, the sleeper must awaken. And that was the whole aspect of leadership. And they allude to it when he's talking to him at the beginning, when he says, you will, you will find your path. And, and what they do allude to in the, at the end of the, this film is at the end they talk to, they talk about it, but they don't, they don't explain it really well is Paul Atreides has to die so that the Messiah can rise. It was the beginning when he took that life there it was the beginning of him letting go of his old self and becoming starting on this path of the 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 of their messiah the quizax hatterack okay and and so that's kind of the thing but see again i know the story did you pick <laughs> up any of that in the film no 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 i didn't and get any of that <laughs> that's the issue with the film it really is um it really is. If you knew the story going in, the movie is really enjoyable to a certain degree because I know the story. I can get by with that because I really know what's going on already. Um, and and it's just beautifully. It's beautifully shot. It's it's just epic in scale, and I like that about this film. Um, I like the concept art. I, I love the 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 little the dragonfly. Oh, copter, those I thought know, were cool. Kind of I like those. The the way they did the big ships and that kind of stuff. It was really interesting. Troy, you got your hand up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, do you think that? Do you think that you watching the movie twice hel- helped you enjoy it a little bit more? Because I know you watched it one time here and then um, one time in the movie theater. So, like, is there any way you kind of thought that it helped you understand it more the second time you watched it? Great question. The answer to that, unfortunately, is no. Wow. Um, the it, I, it's even though you've seen it, when you go back a second time, it still won't. If you don't know the full story, and this is my biggest issue with this film is the story is they cut it off halfway through the second act. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm I'm sorry, but a battle to the death scene does not make an ending of a movie. <laughs> and and it, and there was an explanation of where they're headed or where they're going. It just it was a poor choice to make it into two films or three films even. I think it's worse if they do it into three. I think that's terrible. You need because ah oh, that would just suck if they did that. <laughs> I don't um, know. I, I'm just going by what one YouTuber had said. Um, she said that, I had heard two parts. I that's what I had heard that it was going to be two parts, I and, don't know. and they did. This is halfway through the story. Okay, where he meets the Fremen. Because the biggest part, the, the the first act is really the fall of House of Trade. That's where they got, um, where, the, you know, they had gotten betrayed, you got betrayal, and then they come in and just wipe them out. And they did not show how horrible House Harkonnen was. Um, they didn't show that, which is good because I really didn't like it in the 84. It was too gritty in the 1984 version. Okay, I have another question for you. <clears throat> sure. I also heard that they may be doing a prequel um, TV series on HBO Max. Ha- do you have any interest in that? Um, um, there are prequel books. Um, actually, right, actually. Yeah. Uh, his son and another writer with the help of another writer. I believe the other writer was Kevin J. Anderson, who has wrote some Star Wars stuff. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. That is who it is. Okay. Uh, Brian Herbert. Brian Herbert is right. the son. And I think they took some of the notes and stuff that, that Frank Herbert had built the world with. Um, but what's interesting is uh, I think Frank Herbert was what they call a pantser. 
He wrote by the seat of his pants. He was not a planner. And so he would develop stuff and develop worlds and stuff. And so there's a lot of stuff that people are like, well, where's it going next? Or, you know, there wasn't a lot. So what, what Brian Herbert did is try to bring out some of those notes and stuff and put them into writings. And, um, and, and I hear they're interesting. There's a lot of books now. There's a ton of books. Um, if they do a prequel series on HBO Max, I will watch it. Okay. Um, because, again, I, I know the story of Dune, the first book. You, you know what I mean? Right. I know that story. And I know what happens to it. I've always wanted the next book because I wanted to see because how powerful he becomes. Imagine, if you will, in Star Wars realm, you take Luke Skywalker – in the in the first one, this you know kind of a thing, and then by the end of the film, he's a Jedi Master. Yeah, okay. That's that's what Dune, the story of Dune, is. You take this young son who's got royal blood and has been designed for centuries to finally become the Quizax Hatterack, and he starts there. But yet at the end, he is he's he's not only a Jedi Master, he's head of the Jedi Council kind of a thing he becomes that powerful yeah but see in star wars i think part of the draw is luke was a nobody you know he was nothing at all he's a farm boy right any of us could become that right you know and Mm -hmm. i i think that's the big draw with luke skywalker in in his story with paul paul's royalty you know and uh, he's already royalty it's like yeah whatever you got every advantage which and luke had no advantage none he had no my midi chlorian counts bigger than your midi chlorian count. <laughs> <laughs> Troy's got his hand up again. Yeah, go ahead, Troy. <laughs> Wasn't I just didn't really understand the concept of the chosen one and how they cro- they cross bu- bloodlines to make the chosen one is the chosen one someone that can like use their use that little voice that's like give me the water. Okay, so yeah, right. That's a good yeah. question. Water. Come here, kill it. But then, yes. But then, oh, okay. So then, if they if they don't explain already, it, but yeah. see, bro, you bring up a good point. They don't explain it in the film. Yeah, but the the uh, nun person he went to see that like made yes. him put her, her, his hand in the box. Yes, which like mm-hmm. made him feel pain. Mm-hmm. She could do the voice thingy too. Yes. Wait a minute! Did they do the hand in the box thing? Yeah, they did do the hand in the box. Thing. I must have fell asleep. So, yeah. Okay. Because so I remember that did. from the '84 version. They did. I remember them doing they the hand the in the box thing. thing. I think it's okay. So if they put the two together, it'd be just phenomenal. So the all right so the woman who's there troy is the like the reverend mother she's the head of the entire order she's oh, wait, actually wait, wait. right there with the with the uh what's his name the the emperor oh okay so if she could use her voice like her little voice that was also like give me the water or come here boy right um she shouldn't she just wouldn't she be the chosen one and then they wouldn't have to um, and we wouldn't have to try and make another. And then if if they um eventually did put Paul and that one girl together and they had a baby, then would it also be a chosen one? Oh, okay. All right. Great thinking, Troy. Great thinking. So first off, I think there it's always it it's the I don't think it's a patriarchal thing, but I think it has something to do with power that they don't let the men live. Now, here's the thing. Robert Jordan in the Wheel of Time series deals with this very issue, that the women can wield the magic, but the men, if the men wield it, it's tainted, and they end up going mad later on. They go crazy. So it's that kind of concept. So I think they, they, you know, when she said, you know, if you couldn't control your animalistic urges, we would have to kill you. She does say that there. I would have killed you. Mm. And so they sift. She get, they gives this whole thing this, that she says, we sift people to make sure that they're okay kind of a thing. And so if Paul is the chosen one, then mm-hmm. um, why did he only use his voice to ask for the water? Like, why couldn't he, like, use his voice to, um, sure. like, when he was 
getting taken away, why couldn't he just use his voice to say, bring me back to Arcades or something? Right. Um, so it's a journey film. So he's not quite there yet where he's the chosen one. He becomes the chosen one as the book progresses, as the film right. progresses. And by the time he's at the end, he tells her this is what this is what he tells the Reverend Mother because she's not really a good character. She really isn't. She's all about her what her agenda is, and she's manipulating the Emperor, even though the Emperor thinks he's manipulating her. It's just, it's political intrigue. But Paul Atreides, when he becomes the Messiah, you call it political intrigue. I call it political snore. <laughs> <laughs> good one good one the the thing is is she she does have power but what paul tells her is he says he says go to that place you dare not look in your mind and when you do you will see me there staring back at you and it's just an incredible moment to talk about wow. the power of his ability because that was the whole thing. The Kwisak's Haderach is like the God man on earth kind of a thing. That's mm -hmm. how they kind of play that. And there's stuff that happens. Like in the 84 film, at the very, very end, he makes it rain on Arrakis. The king? Uh, the, the Paul Atreides does. Oh. Mm. And all. Now – <clears throat> they do have kids just to go back to that question troy would his son become the you know would his son become the you know a chosen one as well um so his son they have twins they have a boy and a girl oh luke and leia <laughs> kind of <laughs> and, and uh and so that that's what occurs so those are great questions troy is good insight um and that's fair because again i think we just keep going back over and over again the story does not explain teach show what the rhythms are behind what all's happening and and i'm not a fan of films that say well we'll just give you bits and pieces until you get to the you know we'll just allude to stuff and then we'll tell you everything at the end so you can go back and watch it all again no nah, i'm not up for that <laughs> you gotta explain it as you go and and unfortunately even though how beautiful this movie is the story just didn't carry it. So and I'm sorry it was boring because I really wanted if, to like this film too. If um, so I would have given it a higher rating if it wasn't. You had to know the story to know the to know what the movie was talking about mm -hmm. because um, it kind of felt like they're trying to get more money for you to come back. Um, and if you, if you haven't read the book, then you don't understand it. I forgot what I was saying, so I just said what I actually just said. There you go. No, it's good. And that, that is a good point. It does make you wonder, no, give me – this is – Mike, this goes back to what we've talked about in the past. No, no. Give me the story in this. Don't propel me to another one because you're just, you're just taking my money, and I don't like that. Give me what I paid for. I paid for a story for a whole experience. Well, I'm glad I didn't pay to go see this in the movie theater. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, I am very happy I just watched this on HBO Max because I would have been sorely disappointed had I paid 16 bucks for a movie ticket for this, plus popcorn and soda and, yeah, uh, yeah, that's a whole different conversation that I. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, that's the way I feel about this. I'm sorry. And I, I nope. really did want to like it. And, you know, people are comparing this. They're saying, of course, this has been said before, too. OK, um, but they're, they're trying to say that, oh, this is the next Lord of the Rings. Or this is the next Star Wars. Uh, yeah, I don't I don't think so. I, I don't no. think so. They the they books? tried to say the same thing about Avatar. And I was like, nope, 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 nope. Avatar is never going to compare to either Lord of the Rings or Star Wars. Sorry. Nope, nope. It's not going to happen. <laughs> and yeah. I, I don't think this comes anywhere near those two series at all. And the Dune doesn't Dune doesn't have the cool uh, lightsabers. Dune has um, <laughs> it does uh, it does have I, its own weapon. Yeah. We didn't see it. We did not see I, it. I do think oh. though that oh. when um Paul took the the gun from the uh pack that the girl he dreamed about was in and like how it boom and it like extended. Mm -hmm. I thought that was kind of cool. Now, because he 
he ahead. knew how to use it like immediately he like turned over like did this whole captain america thing <laughs> and he like pulled the he pulled harley gun out and then the other part of the gun out and it was really cool mm-hmm. now they did do the whole like when they were doing the training scene and they they use those shield things mm-hmm. I, I don't know what you call that um, I don't know. What they, I don't remember what they were called, but yeah, the little things. They did that, and I, I recognized that from watching what what little I did of the nineteen eighty four version. And I went, "Wow, that's a, that looks a lot better than it did in the nineteen eighty four version." That is true. It looks a little blocky. It looks like Minecraft, right? It yeah, that. it looked. And I know, I know the technology's changed, and it was also a made for TV movie, and so on and so forth. But it was just like right. when I watched that in the nineteen eighty four one, I was like. This just looks weird and goofy. Um, when I watched it in this one, I thought, oh, they improved on that. That looks kind of cool, actually. And then mm-hmm. they actually used it in the battle, you know, in some of the battles and stuff, which I thought was kind of cool, too. So, mm-hmm. I mean, there's some neat concepts in it. There's uh, great concepts. I'll, I'll give it that. Um, I also <laughs> heard that the daggers, the blades of the daggers are actually supposed to be from the teeth of the sandworms. Yeah, I didn't get that from the film, though. You didn't get it from the film. That's the whole point. I'm like, there's so much great stuff they should have shared about. Right. I mean, if they would have shared that in the film, I, at least I would have gave me something interesting to grab onto. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I would have. I would have given it a higher score because the the way it looked on the big screen was really good. Because I know they filmed it in like an actual desert. Two and- deserts, actually. Oh really? To mm-hmm. uh, okay, and I thought it was I thought it was really good, like artistically. If I knew the story, it would be like a four sandworms out of five, which is <laughs> I it's... gave it three point five. Even though I knew the story, I gave it three point five. But I was really I was upset about the storytelling. Well, I usually give high scores on movies. <clears throat> yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> But I just didn't. I just didn't like this one. I agree with you. I didn't like this one either. <laughs> and, I love. I I love the artistic vision behind it. Sure. I loved how they they took concepts and really made them better, like the shield, like you were talking. Um, I was upset that they didn't talk about the weirding modules. The what? Uh, the weirding modules. What is a weirding it's, module? It's it's exactly. Weird. Right. It's this really cool weapon. They do show it in the 1984 version early on. Okay. And where they can speak and say words, and it amplifies that into something, into some kind of weapon. In other words, like a a wind blast, a fire blast, a a percussion blast, you know, just by saying things. Hmm. And um, they, and it's an incredible fighting style. And you get to see him do that in the last battle a little bit. You get to see her do it really well. Where the way she moves and stuff, and then she was able, and he says, "Oh, you you know the weirding way," and uh, and she was like, "Our conversation got cut short," you know, kind of a thing. I was like, <laughs> oh, that's kind of cute, but they don't talk about it because in the second half of the of the story is they teach the Fremen the weirding way. Hmm. They set them up and they teach leaders, and then those leaders become trainers, and they teach others, and they go to teach thousands of this and then they create the weirding modules that go along with their fighting and they don't do they you don't you don't see that so how they're going to bring it up in the second film when you didn't even bring up in the first film is it just an unfortunate disconnect yeah i just thought the whole movie is weird yeah we'll see what happens is what happens in the second half is paul no longer there there's a thing like a microphone they speak into for it right and for the module, by the time it gets to the end, Paul does not need the weirding module anymore. He can just speak his stuff and it happens. Uh, um, and there's a big, cool fight scene at the end uh, where where he does that as his final blow against the guy he's already defeated kind of a thing. And they're like, oh, oh, oh. so but we miss that. We don't get that. Now, so. And they also all had these tubes in their nose. Is that to help them breathe? On the so sand so obviously planet. you fell asleep in that part too. <laughs> Apparently so, so did Brenda because she asked me. <laughs> so the suit that they were wearing 
recycled their body water and waste and all that it cycles it the movement that they do pumps the action the way they're designed the fremen designed them and so the the tubes in their noses catches the condensation from their bodies in order to recycle that water okay it's usually so you sweat through your nose? No, you sweat no. through your body. But when you breathe through your nose, there's condensation Station. and stuff that happens. Oh. Gotcha. Okay. So that's that's what that was for. It was to catch the air and stuff and all that so they could – and all that. It was part of the suits, which is, I think, one of the most intriguing aspects about the Fremen and about the storytelling is having a suit the way it's designed to capture your water because that is – the most precious commodity in that desert is water. Right. Okay. Uh, yeah. Although I thought spice was, but okay. spice is the most important thing in the universe. Right. Okay. As far as trade is because, you know, and that was another thing they didn't show. They didn't show why the spice was so important. Well, they no, I got, I got somewhere in the film. They talk about spice being good for fuel, but it, also, basically, got them high. <laughs> well, it gets them high. That's the, that's one part of it. It gets them high. You know, it expands their consciousness. It doesn't get them high. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> but the other thing that they don't talk about is what it does. You don't get to see the space guild. You kind of get to see them. I assume the guys with the funny helmets. Yeah. Not not yeah. the stormtrooper helmets, but the ones that almost look like the helmet took up their whole right. top part of their body. Right. That's the space guild. I think. And in the space guild, what they do is you saw those big cylinder ships, you know, above the planet and you saw the ship passing through them. Well, the thing is, is what they do with the spice is it alters their consciousness in the aspect that allows them to fold space and time. And what they do is ships go in, then they fold space and time, and then the ships go out compared to wherever they're trying to get to. That's how they're able to do space travel. And that's why they have to have the spice. Because there's a certain race, there's the spacing guild, there's a sp- certain race of aliens that's able to take that spice and do that. And the the thing about the Kwisak Haderach, the what makes the Messiah so important in the way they've written the story is, it, they allude to it in this film, in in, in the Dune twenty one version, is that that Paul Atreides should be able to do it on his own. Without any help, you know, kind of a thing. Okay. So that's that's the whole thing. There's so much more. Uh, this it, the one of the themes behind the books is that they don't talk about, and it is in some of the prequels, which will probably be the prequel story in all openness, is taking away from the um, they got away from any thinking machines. So there was no thinking machines or anything like that. So no computers or anything. They they got away from that and had to create other technology. Now, I don't know the reason for the rationale for it. But the one guy who did the the big guy that was on the thing and his eyes went weird and he did calculations and stuff. They said how much how much money to, or how, you know how much money was it for them to come out here? How much to do that? And his eyes rolled up in his head. It looked like they rolled up in his head and he he's what they call a mentat. But they didn't talk about Mintats. They didn't share anything about him while he was able to do that, why his eyes did the thing they, that they did. It was really weird. They just didn't do good storytelling. Huh. So he's a, he's a walking calculator. He's a walking calculator. Okay. Yep. Yep. That's really what it yeah, is. Yeah, I didn't so, get yeah. that. I did, oh, I did okay. also learn that uh, all of the, the, the race from the sand planet, all their eyes were that bright blue. And mm-hmm. I did learn that the reason they're bright blue is because of the spice, which yes. I, I thought that was interesting too. But again, I didn't get that from the film. <laughs> I got it from a YouTuber after the film. Right. <laughs> it's like, it, oh, and that's so the thing. You guys are right. And I will give that to you is the film does not do a great job of doing the storytelling and setting it up. You have to know the story in order to enjoy this film. And that shouldn't be the case. No, it shouldn't. I, I should be able to watch a film and get the story from it. Yep. And and there's so much that I just didn't get from this film. And I, right. I which made it boring and 
Oh my gosh. You know, uh, I remember, I remember when Star Trek, the motion picture came out and when, you know, I was, I was pretty young when it came out and, um, I remember watching that going, Oh my God, this movie is so boring. And I, I think part of that is because I was a Star Wars fan. I was so used to Star Wars and Star Wars is just almost non nonstop action, you know, right. and, and Star Trek is not really that, but <laughs> now that I've seen this movie, I'm like, wow, this, this makes uh Star Trek, the motion picture, not so boring. <laughs> Yeah, I wonder if there's a certain time within our sci-fi history of where people are trying to do more commentating on social issues rather than action and adventure. I don't know, because I think social issues has always been a uh, staple within the sci-fi community. I I, I think you could say that throughout all of sci-fi. Um, yeah. but I think we do, we do go through periods where it changes and, and evolves. Um, and, and I think through the eighties, nineties, um, you know, we had probably had a lot more action, um, mm-hmm. probably started in the late seventies going into the eighties. I would say Star Wars did it. Yeah. I would say Star Wars. Did oh, I do. Yeah. I would too. I would too. I think Star Wars is huge influence on that. Um, mm-hmm. But and you know George George Lucas is famously known for his directing. What, what's his <laughs> What's one of his biggest uh, uh, directions is um, faster, more intense. You know, yeah. So, <laughs> had to right. get some kind of George Lucas qu- quote in there. That's right. Every time there's <laughs> our drinking game, right? <laughs> well, realistically, I think I mean I think we've said all that we can say about this film. <laughs> is it and I think we've stated is is it okay to watch it on HBO Max if you have HBO Max? Yes. Is it worth going in and see it, see it in the theater if you don't know the story? No. If you do know the story, excuse me, and you want a great artistic film, yes, go see it. Because the scope on the screen is incredible. It just is in the theater. It really is. Uh, it's larger than life kind of a thing, and it looks really good. The sound design is good. So, yeah. Yeah, I'd say if you're already a fan of it, yeah, probably go see mm-hmm. it in the movie theater. Um, honestly, yeah. if if you do not know Dune uh, and you got HBO Max. You're have a tough role with it. Yeah, you watch it on HBO Max because <laughs> you're going to have and watch some And watch some YouTube clips before you do it. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah, Troy, what's up? Um <clears throat> what were the um nun's names? Or what was the nun's name that made him put his hand in the box? Like something mother, his something mother? I don't um, know. It was uh, um what was her character called? Her character was called Like her foreign mother or something. Uh, or Gaius no, Helen Mohiam or something, the Reverend Mother thing. I'm oh not, yeah, oh. yeah. I wanted. I just wanted to make sure because I wanted to make a joke about that. Oh, why is that? What's that? Because I knew. Because I knew you guys were going to talk about Star Wars, so I have to say, Paul, I am your Reverend Mother. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I, I, I right. I'm your father. I'm your Reverend Mother. That was good. That was funny. Oh, my goodness. So, all right. Well, yeah. With that, I can't follow that. <laughs> well, Troy, thanks for hanging out with us. Yeah, thank I, I know you, Troy. you would have done it after we saw the film uh, that you wanted to be on the show. So, uh, it, it's been interesting to have you here with us to give you your childlike perspective. <laughs> What's that supposed to mean? Nothing. Not at all. It means you said what you meant. You said it plain as day. And I like that. You just, you stated it. This is what I like. This is what I didn't like. What what does Yoda Yoda say in the, in the prequels? uh, um, There's nothing like a a child's mind. I I can't remember the exact quote, but. Yep. Yep. It's a compliment, Troy. I'm sorry. It is. It's a compliment. All right. Well. Troy, thanks for being here with us. I'm going to go ahead and just wrap things up because I I don't think there's anything else we can say. (laughs) 
Yeah, not I'm unless sorry, you want me Mike. to go to sleep. I, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I did want you to enjoy this film, and I was excited about seeing it. I wanted and, to enjoy it. I really, really did. I wanted this to be, you know, a big favorite of mine. And oh my gosh, no, no, I can't say that it is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's some good points in it, but the story just didn't carry the film no. the, the way they did the story. Not at all. Yep. All right, my brother. Well, I'm done. <laughs> Stick a fork in him. He's done. Looks like we beat you. <laughs> yep. You guys beat me. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So with that said, <laughs> over and out and may the force be with you. Thank you for joining us today on the two geeks and a microphone podcast. Tune in next week when we will have more news and reviews. Until then, may the force be with you. <laughs>